This tank chat is going to be about this vehicle, the M18 Hellcat, a tank destroyer that was used by American forces in the Second World War, which went on to have a lengthy lifespan after World War II with a number of other countries. Please remember to like, subscribe or click the little notification bell if you don't want to miss out on these videos. And I'd just like to say thank you to all our patrons for making this possible. Please join them if you can. Now, to talk about this vehicle, it's here, we're at uh, Tankfest 2022, and it's a guest vehicle, beautifully presented. But to take you back, this idea of why vehicles like this were made, we need to know about things like doctrine. How were they going to be used? What was a military building vehicles like this, which is called a tank destroyer, and not actually a tank? What was the reasoning behind that? Now, in the late 1930s, America, it's gone through the period with the US Army looking at retaining numbers, but not investing in new sets of equipment that particularly much. They're doing experimentation in the 30s, but don't go into mass production. Um, when the war clouds in Europe, 1939, it's pretty obvious things are gonna go badly wrong the US Congress starts reinvesting in the US military and much debate takes place, which has already been sort of, you know, it's been, inception has been in the 30s, but it comes to a head early in 1940 and 41, where the US Army has to now decide how it's going to purchase equipment, what equipment it's going to need, and how it thinks it's going to use that equipment in modern warfare. And that debate that's been going on in the 30s, one of which is, what do we do about tanks? In the US military, they've put the combat cars with the cavalry, they've also put some with the infantry. After the First World War, they did away with their own tank corps. Um, and they've been watching, as most armies around the world, looking at how tanks, when they are being used in the 20s and 30s, does it, does it reveal more about the way that armoured warfare might progress in the future. And uh, the trouble is that most of the conflicts that go on, there's very not much as a way of a conclusion about uh, how future armoured warfare may take place. Things like the Spanish Civil War, you know, it's not actually very clear the lessons, different countries learn different lessons from the fighting that go goes on there. So the Americans decide in uh, the beginning of 1940, there's a major debate going on should armour stay with the cavalry? Should it stay with the infantry? Should we create this new armoured uh, force, another tank corps equivalent again? And finally, that decision is made to go for a new tank force. But tanks are also going to be what they call GHQ battalions. They're going to remain some tanks with the infantry to help them on the attack and as part of this new doctrine that's come up with, they look at the idea of tank destroyers instead of just towed anti-tank guns spread out along a line. Let's look, they say, at the idea of putting a powerful anti-tank gun on a lighter chassis that is kept together as a force. And should there be an enemy breakthrough of armour, this will be the force that then speedily goes to meet it rather than being spread out along a front line. Um, now, these debates are going on. It's Marshall who puts together, the head of the US Army, um, an anti-tank planning board in April of 1941. And that decision for this new uh, offensive force that's going to be the Armoured Corps, there's going to be this new anti-tank force, or the tank destroyer force, that then becomes known, that's put under Lieutenant Colonel Andrew Bruce. They set up an establishment at Fort Hood in Texas and the doctrine that comes out of there is very much that they want speed and mobility. Um, they don't worry so much about armour protection for the vehicles they're going to put into service and they start off like so many different organisations. They start with a standard anti-tank gun, about a 37mm they think should go on a chassis but as the war progresses very quickly they realise we're going to need bigger guns on these vehicles. Um, initially, they're starting to use vehicles like uh, the M3 GMC, which is basically the half track with a field howitzer put on the top of it. They look at other vehicles that, uh, to put into production. 
The M10 is one that becomes quite famous as a tank destroyer. We're going to look at one that, because the M10 looks like, based on a Sherman, it's still fairly big and heavy, high profile, they quite quickly, in December of 41, they put in a specification that they want a faster, lighter vehicle for quick manoeuvre around the battlefield, and that is what ultimately becomes the M18. And again, back to that idea of the doctrine. These are vehicles that are going to move very quickly to where an enemy armoured breakthrough is and ambush those advancing enemy vehicles. That's the idea behind it. They are not going to be trying to take on a one-to-one -one tank battle in the open, um, and that's why they give them less armour to make them speedier. That's that principle behind them. Now, they look at the idea, originally the specification is for um, actually Christie suspension. They want to use the R975, the radial engine that's going into service with the, some of the Sherman models. Um, they think that's going to be the best for used and that specifying that early on, the 37 millimeter gun. Um, but by April 1942, already they are looking at upgrading that to a 57 millimeter gun. And then quite rightly, as the Sherman's going into production, um, the tank destroyer command say, well, we might as well have the same gun as the Sherman, the 75 millimeter, and then you've got commonality of ammunition, etc. Um, that ends up morphing into the idea of taking the 76 millimeter with its better armor penetration capabilities. So in the end, the M18 Hellcat gets the 76 millimeter gun, the M1A1 version early on, and then it gets variants on that theme of the 76 millimeter as newer models come up. What happens is instead of ordnance coming up with the design of this particular vehicle, uh, they end up passing it out to General Motors, and this ends up being designed by a subsection of General Motors, Buick, and uh, a gentleman there called um, Harley Earl is one of the guys who has a design office within Buick, and he is the guy that's credited for masterminding much of the Hellcup de design. Um, Harley Earl, by the way, after the war goes on, he's the guy that designs all those lovely big fins on American cars in the 50s, um, so he's quite notorious for that. Um, what he ends up coming out with, he gets rid of the idea of the Christie suspension and they go for torsion bar suspension instead. They go for that R975 engine, early models, 350 horsepower, later models of the engine get you up to about 400 horsepower. Same again, so it's that same engine that's being used in the Shermans, but because it's in so much lighter chassis, you're looking at about 18 tonnes as opposed to 30 tonnes with the Sherman M4. This means you've got an awful lot more power to take this vehicle around much, much quicker. And they combine that engine with something called a 900T Torquematic auto transmission, which basically is an automatic gearbox. So you can put the gears into ranges and those ranges start up to about 16 miles an hour. You go from 12 to 34 miles an hour, 30 to about 60 miles an hour. And in the middle of those ranges, you've got pretty much a, a good cruising speed. So you've got three ranges there and the gearbox compensates for you on that. Um, you're looking there at a, a vehicle that um, can get you up to, on open roads, 55 miles an hour, which is a staggering speed when you think of armour in World War II. Hence that uh, desire, you know, and they're meeting it with the 55 miles an hour um, speed to get to where they think the problem's going to be. Um, there's a five-man crew in the vehicle, so you've got three up in the turret, two in the front. You have a co-driver's position. And like the Chaffee, this is a vehicle where there's actual dual controls for the front two positions. So one can take over driving if the other one's getting too exhausted, gets wounded, whatever, on that side of things. Open top turret with armour protection all around the vehicle, just over about 12 millimetres, half an inch thick. Um, that will stop small arms fire, but not much else. And again, that's on purpose to make sure the vehicle stays light for that mobility factor that's required. So you're looking at a vehicle that really sacrifices armour protection for mobility and speed. Now, in terms of the gun, they've got that 76 millimetre. You can fit in this vehicle 45 rounds, 18 in either side on the sponsons, 
and eight ready rounds are there in the turret or nine ready rounds really ready to go on the side of the turret there. A well-trained crew um, can get about 20 rounds off in a minute and the whole of that turret can spin round very, very quickly. Um, it can do a whole 360 in about 24 seconds. And again, that's part of this speed to the target, speed of engagement when it's required, and also speed moving to another position because you don't want to be hanging around if you are meeting that enemy. And uh, this one has got the muzzle brake on. Some of the earlier guns, they were supplied with the M1A1, 76 millimeter that doesn't have the muzzle brake. Later models are fitted with a muzzle brake. Some of them you'll see are actually produced with the, um, the actual screw fixings there, but they don't actually have the muzzle brake on. Muzzle brake in the main is there to try and actually dissipate the blast effect of the 76 millimeter um, because it obscuration, it stops the crew seeing where the round's falling. Um, so they put that on to try and channel the blast instead of going down and kicking up lots of dust they blast it out to the side so hopefully they've got a better chance of being able to see what they need to see up ahead of them. So the advantage of that open top turret that this vehicle has means the crew, the three guys in the turret there, commander, gunner, loader, have really good all-round visibility so they can see and pick a target quite quickly. The downside of that, of course, is in the winter, you're exposed, it's uh, cold weather, and if you're under shell fire, snipers or shell fragmentation, etc., you're pretty much exposed there. So there's a downside to that as well uh, on one of these vehicles. Now that doctrine is taken to Europe by American forces. The M18 is first sees action at, uh, after the Anzio landings. Um, Tunisia, again, the tank destroyer doctrine as being perpetrated by M10s there, etc. Patton says, rather quite politely, he tries to say um, it was unsuccessful in the conditions of the theater. And you've got people like Divas, American general who's out in uh, Europe, looking at what's going on, saying, look, we understand why we did that as a doctrine, but we don't really think this is working. The idea that you're, you can have your anti-tank units available when German armour appears at the right place on the battlefield or even to get there successfully is seen to be much more problematic in reality than the planners thought. So Divas argues from Europe back to people like Leslie McNair in the States and arguing again uh, against um, the uh, tank destroyer doctrine which is we think you're going to need more tanks with more powerful guns to meet enemy armour not just these tank destroyers. Um, and quite quickly, this fundamental thought process of how the tank destroyer is going to be worked, it starts being watered down and dissipated. And uh, for example, Bradley, when he's offered M18s, he first of all, he refuses them before D-Day. Um, they're actually passed on to Patton's Third Army. Um, he prefers actually the M10s. Um, he doesn't see the use of this speed in the way, way that it's being proposed and the number of these tank destroyer battalions is cut in half quite early on in the Northwest Europe campaign. And the actual production of these vehicles, again, there was going to be quite a considerable number of them. Um, they stopped being made um, 2,507 overall as opposed to the many thousands that were actually originally planned because there's a realisation they are not actually performing the job they were intended to do and tanks um, are much better at doing that. Um, in, in a sense, again, it gives you an indication at its height in just, I think, in the spring of 1945, there's only just over 500 M18s in service in the US Army. So in terms of their overall contribution to the war effort, it's a very small part of American armor in Northwest Europe. Now, they do have moments um, where they're actually, um, you know, have their, uh, their day in the manner that they were supposed to be fighting at Aracor um, in September of 44. Uh, their stats at about 39 German tanks knocked out for about uh, four M18s knocked out in one particular unit, which were very successful. That's a very good kill ratio there. Um, at Bastogne, there is an example where their speed means they can get to a position um, and they basically take a villager to stop the enemy from taking it. So their speed has an advantage there. 
and that's probably the engagements as well in Bastogne in the Battle of the Bulge where they see the most action um, but I repeat overall their intended role doesn't seem to happen that way so they tend to end up being dissipated and used for more general armoured support of infantry battalions. Uh, after the war they are used again uh, small numbers in Korea, they're sold on a number of countries, Greece, um, a number are given to Yugoslavia as part of defensive age to Tito trying to build up the Yugoslav army with uh, Western military forces. If you've watched all your Kelly's heroes, those lines of Shermans there in that, they're all Yugoslav um, Shermans that have been supplied by America with upgrades. This particular vehicle is one that was gifted, it goes back to America, it has an upgrade on it, it's gifted to the Yugoslavian military. It then in the 80s when there's conflict between uh, Serbs and Croatians, this is being used again and it's actually got a battle damage on the front from that conflict. And then it was one of a number that were put together uh, in 2004, bought by an entrepreneur who then shipped them to the UK and sold a number to private collectors. And this one, beautifully presented, is actually owned by a private collector who's brought it here to our Tank Fest event. So they do actually see quite a bit of lengthy service and because a number of them were in armies um, well after World War II, that's why quite a number have survived and that's why we see quite a number actually being used um, at events like our Tank Fest. But to circle back, the actual aim of what this vehicle was built for, this tank destroyer doctrine, is actually seen to be a flawed doctrine in World War II. It doesn't really work. And the actual contribution in terms of the fighting that M18 Hellcats made in World War II, you have to be honest and say it's fairly minimal.